Our third speaker of the evening is Honorable Judge Riley, the topic committals for trial. His Honorable Judge Riley received his Bachelor of Arts in 1966 from McMaster University, his Bachelor of Law in 1968 from Osgoode Hall, and was called to the bar in 1970. Since 1970, in only 11 years, his Honour has had really four careers, which ought not to be interpreted as an inability to hold on to a job. First two years of his practice, he was a defense counsel practicing criminal law in Toronto. In 1972, he received the Laidlaw Fellowship, and in 1973, did his Master of Law degree at the London School of Economics. I must admit some contribution to Bob, as he then was, going to uh, London. Uh, I preceded him the year before and on the same fellowship, and throughout the year, he would write to me and ask how I was enjoying the academic experience. And when I had to delay writing back because every letter I wrote back apologized because I was off on the continent, it encouraged him to share that academic experience. 1973, he returned to Canada, was Assistant Crown Attorney in the Judicial District of York, and then transferred to Kitchener and was Assistant Crown Attorney in the Judicial District of Waterloo. Since 1970, he's been a judge of the Provincial Court in Kitchener. His Honour Judge Riley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my Lord, Your Honours, ladies and gentlemen, when I was first asked to address you on this topic, I must say that I shared some of the concerns of His Honour Judge Grayburn. It cannot be said that committal for trial has the same sparkle and zest as insanity or self-defense or the titillating appeal of uh, ramifications of Section 142 of the Criminal Code. But I don't think I could be accused of exaggerating if I said to you that no other area and the administration of criminal justice has attracted in recent years more attention, comment, criticism. Indeed, there are those who question the very basis for the continuation of the preliminary inquiry as we now know it. Uh, for what it's worth, uh, and of course my duty is to administer the law as, as, exists, as it exists or as it's changed, I think that the preliminary inquiry properly, responsibly handled is one of the most critically important parts of the administration of criminal justice, and I think it will continue to be so. With respect to committal for trial itself, there has been a rather remarkable clarification of the law very recently. The paper which I had prepared for your assistance, and which uh, I had actually hoped would have been dispensed to you prior to tonight, is actually divided into four sections, the last of these sections being simply a table of cases. The two middle sections are the evidentiary basis for committal and the procedural issues, preserving the record. The whole first section is devoted to an examination of the case of Regina and Chabot. I'd actually intended to spend very little time dealing with the paper as such, and in fact to stray into practical areas, uh, tactical considerations regarding committal for trial, but particularly as it has not yet been dispensed, you'll bear with me uh, as I do touch on some of the high points of the document. As I commence, perhaps somewhat melodramatically, dealing with the Chabot case, one could comment that very seldom do the winds of change sweep strongly through the courts of justice, and only then, in theory, by virtue of parliamentary action, by definition, courts of law don't change the law, they merely serve to clarify, to interpret the law. If that be so then, as I said, the Chapeau case from the Supreme Court of Canada is a very remarkable clarification because it certainly changed a lot of people's idea of what they thought the law was. The decision makes it quite clear that a magistrate presiding at a preliminary inquiry may commit on the charge in the information or on an included offense, but he clearly does not have available to him the range of committal that many of us previously thought. He may not even, as the Ontario Court of Appeal thought in the Chabot case, commit on a related charge. As I say, the belief that he had this much wider range of committal powers 
was one that was widely held amongst practicing counsel, certainly amongst Crown attorneys, and amongst those of us who preside at preliminary inquiries. There was always a certain uneasiness about really how far you could go. Something never did smell quite right when you started off on an armed robbery and you were asked for a committal on a rape charge. And by the way, that uh, serves as, as, as a good example a number of years ago when I was uh, uh, prosecuting here in Toronto. Uh, and you'll recollect those days, I understand they're changed drastically now. Uh, you simply uh, arrived at, uh, I think it was 33, Your Honor, when you did all the preliminary inquiries and you had a whole list of uh, prelims to do, never having seen the information before and as often as not commencing a preliminary inquiry, often in a fairly serious matter without much more than a glance at the dope sheet. I would commence the prosecution of an armed robbery that wasn't all that serious on its surface. It was basically an allegation of purse snatching woman who was working as a domestic headed home early in the wee small hours of the morning and she was uh, jumped upon by someone who ultimately ran off with her purse. As I got into her evidence, however, there was a different uh, flavor that uh, was developed and I couldn't help but feel that she had received somewhat short shrift from the police officer who had originally investigated her complaint and laid the information. Because as I, I think she herself succinctly put it, when I asked her when the man was holding her down in a rather compromising position. Uh, I said to myself very naively, did you know at that point what he wanted, madam? Uh, was it your purse? Leading outrageously. And <clears throat> she said, he didn't want my purse, he wanted my body. <laughs> and it became quite clear that as we went on, uh, within a few minutes, that what we were in fact dealing with was an act of attempted rape. He was frightened off and decided to make the best of a bad scene and then left with the purse. We adjourned briefly and I had a meaningful discussion with defense counsel and uh, he pleaded to robbery uh, then and there. <laughs> but the point of this story, and I don't mean to digress and certainly I don't mean to tell, tell war stories, uh, the point is that had the matter proceeded, I wouldn't have had no hesitation in asking the presiding magistrate, and I use the term in the criminal code at, uh, at that time, to commit on rape and I strongly suspect he would have been disposed to do so. In order to fully understand the Chabot case, you can't just read the judgment in the Supreme Court of Canada. You've got to go right back and read very carefully the decisions of the Ontario Court of Appeal and specifically as well the decision of uh, this Justice DuPont in the uh, Supreme Court of Ontario. In fact, for what it's worth, I, in my view, you have to go right back to the trial itself presided over by His Honor Judge Bordelow. As in so many cases, the whole issue started on a big mistake, a misunderstanding. Cuse was uh, charged on an information with an offense that both the Crown and the defense clearly believed, and that is true from an examination of the transcript, clearly believed initially was first degree murder. But as you well know, unless first degree murder is specifically charged, of course, it's not first degree murder. The information didn't specifically charge it, and uh, when committal time came around, the defense, uh, when everyone realized what the situation was, the defense uh, suggested to uh, his honor that he couldn't commit on anything greater than the charge that existed on the information, i.e. second degree. Crown took the position that the evidence clearly substantiated first degree murder, and that appears to be, by the way, a point that uh, everyone agreed upon all the way down the line. But he said that the, the presiding magistrate, of course, had the power to commit on any offense revealed by the evidence. Judge Bordelow, uh, not surprisingly, in my view, uh, agreed with him and committed on first degree murder. As a result of this mistake, therefore, the matter went to the uh, Supreme Court of Ontario on uh, a writ of uh, certiorari, habeas corpus, in fact, with certiorari and aid. Mr. Justice, Mr. Justice DuPont in the Supreme Court of Ontario examined the authorities and came to the same conclusion as the Crown and, and, and effectively the same conclusion as uh, His Honor Judge Borlow. And I think, and I don't intend to quote widely, but I think that some of his comments are worthy of consideration. The suggestion that the justice conducting a preliminary hearing is limited to committing for the offense charged or for an included lesser offense seems to defeat one of the basic underlying purposes of the hearing. The justice is required not to try the accused on a particular charge, but to conduct an inquiry relating to such charge. Such inquiry is in the nature of a preliminary investigation of the charge and matters which relate to such charge. 
the scope and latitude exercised by the inquiring tribunal exceed those of a trial tribunal entrusted with the task of determining the, determining the guilt or innocence of the accused. It is thus not uncommon for evidence received at a preliminary inquiry to reveal offenses other than that described in the information. In determining the powers of committal, should a distinction be drawn between such other revealed offenses which can be described as lesser included and those of a more serious nature than that described in the information? I think not, particularly if such revealed offense is related in point of view of time of occurrence or otherwise to the original charge. His Lordship then went on to support the broadening of the scope of a preliminary inquiry when evidence reveals such other offenses and he, in fact, confirmed the committal on the more serious charge of first-degree murder. Uh, indeed, uh, Ms. Justice DuPont disagreed with Judge Bordalo only in that while Judge Bordalo had seen his support for his interpretation of the wide committal powers in Section 463 of the Code, that is, the, the judge must, uh, magistrate must inquire into the charge and any other charge facing the accused, Ms. Justice DuPont felt that Section 463 did not relate to preliminary inquiries per se, that they were uh, regulated by Section 464, which does specify that charge. I'm sure you'll recollect. But the broader power to commit is found, in fact, in Section 475, the committal section itself, which simply says commit for trial on sufficient evidence. Mr. Justice uh, DuPont felt, and it's a very important uh, factor because uh, I think there's been no case that has been considered in one regard or another in recent years than the Doyle case already referred to uh, by his honor. <coughs> Mr. Justice DuPont felt that, <coughs> excuse me, the, the Doyle restrictions on the right of a provincial court judge exercising the jurisdiction of a magistrate, that he, he has no rights unless they are expressly conferred or exist by necessary implication from the criminal code itself, said that that didn't restrict this power of general committal. As he said, the words necessary implication cast a wide net. They were no doubt intended to acknowledge established procedures not specifically provided for in the code, such as the test to be implied, implied in determining whether to commit, the granting of full answer in defense as it relates to preliminary inquiries, the right to commit for offenses other than those described in the information, and many other procedural matters, long established, and most of which are intended to assure a fair and complete inquiry. Let's pause there for the moment now. We've got the decision of, in the Supreme Court of Ontario basically confirming what we all thought the law was. I emphasize that uh, His Lordship's decision is thoughtful, well-reasoned, and certainly based on a considerable amount of established persuasive precedent. Indeed, we just received our beautiful new red copies of Martin's Criminal Code. Uh, you recollect they go green, blue, red or some variation of that theme uh, up until this very red volume if you simply looked at the committal powers under 475 you would at most have seen I think it was Mr. Justice DuPont's decision that was most recently reported in other words on just a very few weeks ago we now know by opening Martins what the law is up to that time by opening your Martins you would have been told something different from that which is interpreted by the Supreme Court of uh, Canada I think this case as well as any, and I think that if I can leave anything with you tonight, it won't be the law because you'll get that from the paper, you'll get it by doing your own research. It's to emphasize to you that there's no such thing as trite law. Don't ever be told there is. Don't be afraid to question, to examine, and to consider that merely because a practice has existed for many years, and merely because it operates smoothly, that doesn't mean it's right. It's, I suppose uh, nobody knows. Nobody knows what's right. Although I suppose by definition the Supreme Court of Canada knows what's right, though they often disagree inter se on what's right. Sort of like the uh, wife of the judge, a uh, good friend of uh, His Honor Judge Langdon, who was uh, walking in one of uh, Toronto's better areas not too long ago and happened to pass uh, a vegetable vendor of the old style whose uh, cart was drawn by a mangy old cart horse. And as she passed him, 
damned if this old horse didn't up and die, just kicked right over in the street with his legs sticking up in the air. And she paused, thoughtful for a second, and went up to the vegetable vendor and said, excuse me, sir, but uh, do you uh, have any use for the carcass? And the fellow notwithstanding the fact that he lost his erstwhile beast of burden and bosom chum over the years was a, something of a pragmatist, and he said, uh, no, would you like him? And she said, yes, I would, as a matter of fact. How much do you want for him? He said, well, no charge at all. As a matter of fact, I'm going to have to get rid of him and pay somebody to do it. If you want him, you can have him. She said, well, that's fine. Let's compromise. Will you help me cart him back to my place? The fellow said, sure. So they unhitched the cart horse, and they hauled him out onto St. Clair, down the sidewalk on St. Clair several blocks to one of Toronto's better high-rise condominiums. As they hauled the old cart horse in the front door, the doorman came out, and uh, you can get away with anything in those classy places. He didn't blink an eye, merely asked if she wished some assistance, which she requested, and all three of them hauled the cart horse into the elevator, up to the penthouse apartment, into the front foyer. And she said, gentlemen, you've been so kind, could I please require your assistance just a little longer? Would you help me get it into the bathroom? So they hauled the old cart horse into the bathroom, and she said, now just one last request, would you help me hoist him up on the bidet? And they did so. And there was the dead cart horse sitting up in the bidet, lifeless hooves planted firmly in the floor, and eyes staring sightlessly at the genuine imitation terrazzo marble on the far wall. And the, of course, the fellow who uh, was selling vegetables didn't dare ask what she wanted to do with the horse, but the, the doorman felt he might have a professional interest in having it, well, at least fielding the complaints from other tenants. So he said, excuse me, madam, I don't wish to pry, but what why do you want the dead cart horse here? And she said, well, she said, my husband's a Supreme Court judge, and he is so smart, he thinks he knows everything. Every time when he comes home at night, I give him some bit of news, and he always looks down his nose at me and says, I know, I know. Tonight, he's going to come home. I'm going to pour him a drink. He's going to go into the bathroom. He's going to come out, and he's going to say, honey, there's a dead cart horse on your bidet. And I'm going to look at him, and I'm going to say, I know, I know. <laughs> The point of that uh, rather silly story is that nobody knows. Okay, moving on to the Ontario Court of Appeal. Very interesting. Decision of uh, Miss Justice Brooke for Miss Justice Wilson and the Chief Justice. They first dealt with an issue that doesn't really concern us tonight, and that is whether or not because there had been, in this case, an indictment signed and effectively lodged with the registrar of the court that uh, habeas corpus of certiorari lay at all. In other words, had the, what they referred to, I believe, as the filing of the indictment uh, prevented the use of the extraordinary remedy and uh, was the only remedy to attack the indictment itself. The court uh, dealt in some considerable detail with the difference between presentment and preferring and what the situation is now in those jurisdictions such as ours where we have no grand jury. I won't go into detail, but uh, suffice to say that uh, the Ontario Court of Appeal found that what had happened was not a bar to the proceedings, that uh, the indictment had not as yet been presented to the court, and I use their terminology. In dealing with the power of committal, Mr. Justice Brooks stated in changing drastically the, the opinion of uh, Mr. Justice DuPont in quashing the committal, in my respectful view, there is nothing in the criminal code today which justifies such a broad approach to the function of the preliminary inquiry. Indeed, it is quite inconsistent with basic principles of criminal law and its requirement that a warrant should issue for arrest on a specific charge that the arrest should be executed on that basis, that the charge should be specified with particularity in the information so that the accused knows the charge, ag charge against him, what he has to meet, and that there be no holding charges. The charge or charges are specific and are the limit of the inquiry. For example, while greater latitude is allowed at a preliminary inquiry than at a, than at a trial, nevertheless, in general, only evidence which is relevant to the charges against the man is admissible. His Lordship then went on to consider considerable precedent, including the Monkman case, the Demare case, and concluded that counsel for the applicant, Mr. Alan Gold, I believe in this case, quote, that from the earlier cases there's been a misunderstanding about the power of a provincial court judge to commit for any offense disclosed by the evidence on the preliminary inquiry. 
In my view, a provincial court judge cannot commit an accused for a greater or more serious offense than that which he is authorized under Section 463 to inquire into. He may, however, commit the accused for an included offense, and here's where it gets interesting, or an offense for which the accused could by law be convicted on the charge, i.e. infanticide where the charge is murder. He may also, in my view, commit the accused for an offense which the evidence discloses the accused probably committed in the course of the alleged commission of the offense with which he's charged, but only where the evidence is not sufficient to put the accused on trial on the charge as laid. As a result, the quashing uh, the committal was quashed. Once again, a thoughtful, well-reasoned, persuasive decision. And you can see, with all due respect to his lordship, and I emphasize it's an excellent decision, if read by itself, certainly, that even his honor, even the, I'm so sorry, his lordship, the, the, the three-member uh, court of appeal, including the chief justice, were, gee, they thought it was heresy to say only on the charges laid or an included offense. They referred to related charges, probably committed uh, during the commission, et cetera, et cetera. Went to the Supreme Court of Canada. The Supreme Court of Canada took, I think, uh, uh, in an excellent decision, the strongest stand of all, confirming that uh, there could not be a committal on the first-degree murder charge. They confirmed the quashing of the information, the quashing of the, of the committal. And they also dealt with whether or not the signing and filing of the indictment with the court should constitute a bar to the proceedings. I want to uh, just touch again very briefly on that. They found as well that filing the indictment did not constitute a bar to the proceedings, that the theretofore separate acts of preferral and presentment are now combined in one step in the province of Ontario and in virtually every other jurisdiction in Canada. The uh, simple act of filing and signing does not constitute preferment because that would then, to use his lordship's words, uh, leave the accused remedy to the whim of the crown. Or as Mr. Justice Creever, Creever said in the case of uh, Jolly and the Queen, that in that case, the situation, in that situation, the race cannot be to the swifter. In other words, just by shooting in that indictment, the accused should not be prevented from exercising his right to application uh, by way of certiorari. The problem is, again, the, the judgment, uh, the language used by Mr. Justice Dixon, and in my view, there is no brighter uh, jurist sitting on the bench in the country today. He said, I would hold that an indictment based upon committal for trial without the intervention of a grand jury is not preferred against an accused until it is lodged with the trial court at the opening of the accused trial with a court ready to proceed with the trial. Slightly more particular language than that used by Mr. Justice Brooke in the Ontario Court of Appeal. But still, where does it leave us? What does that mean with a court ready to proceed with the trial? Does that mean in a Sessions or a size case that there's got to be a jury panel waiting in the wings? Again, not relevant to our discussion, and I'm going to leave it now. But it is of great importance dealing with issues of jurisdiction over the person, et cetera. I would commend to your attention an article written by His Honor Judge Saul Haney in, I think, the most recent bound edition of the Criminal Law Quarterly that deals with that issue. The other fascinating thing that I found, and it causes me some concern, is that their lordships in the Supreme Court of Canada in hearing the Chabot case considered, indeed they invited information or as they referred to it, evidence from attorneys general across the country and from the Federal Department of Justice regarding their procedures normally followed in drafting and filing of indictments. And the way I read the decision, I don't think I'm that far off, they <coughs> seem to place some importance on the procedures which were being used in coming to the decision they reached. Very relevant to their deliberations as I read the, decision, the judgment. I think, again, it, it, it's contrary to the purist view, which I prefer that uh, merely because a practice exists in eight out of 10 Canadian provinces, eight out of 10 attorneys general prefer the following practice, this neither confirms the validity of a practice nor justifies its continuance. I think in fairness, and I don't want to exaggerate, the Supreme Court of Canada was primarily interested in finding out what is going on. Dealing with the power of committal itself, Mr. Justice Dixon dealt with the history of the power itself and an and historical analysis of the case at Barr. And then he expressed what, in my view, is a very practical concern with enlarging the scope of the preliminary inquiry beyond the charge and the information itself. He stated, 
Although a preliminary inquiry is not a trial, it must be conducted in a judicial manner. The rules of evidence relating to relevancy apply to preliminary hearings in the same manner as to trials. I would question the relevance and therefore the admissibility of evidence relating to a charge other than that formally spelled out in the information. Again, the court went on to examine the, the whole import of that part of the criminal code, a general interpretation and the various sections. And I won't go into the comments they made. You'll find those uh, in the paper which will be given to you. But specifically, his lordship concluded page 403, quote, that a justice conducting a preliminary inquiry may inquire into and commit only on the charge included in the information or informations. This includes any included offenses, since included offenses necessarily form part of the original charge. And of course, one is directed to 589 subsection 1 of the criminal code. Now, up to that point, they're effectively agreeing with Ms. Justice Brooke and the Ontario Court of Appeal. But Ms. Justice Dixon, the Supreme Court of, of Canada, went farther, and I think quite properly, and, and to my mind, uh, they made my job one heck of a lot easier, because they also confirmed that presiding just judge, that is a magistrate presiding uh, at a preliminary inquiry, could not, cannot commit on a related charge. Such power does not flow, in the opinion of the Supreme Court of Canada, by necessary implication from the provisions of the criminal code, and I will Quote his lordship at page 404, it seems to me that once it is determined the justice may commit on the charge and not on other offenses disclosed by the evidence, the logical conclusion is that the justice may commit on the charge and nothing else. Simply put, there is no authority, expressed or implied, in the code to commit for trial on other offenses disclosed by the evidence, whether these offenses are related or unrelated to the original charge. I would hold that a justice holding a preliminary inquiry can only commit for the charges laid in the information or informations and included offenses. His Lordship then, and uh, things one must never forget the practical considerations, what are we left with? His Lordship remitted the matter to the provincial court to commit on second degree murder, quote, if so advised, unquote. The law is then very clear, as I indicated when commencing my remarks to you. Presiding magistrate may commit on the charges laid or an included charge, but no other offenses, whether they're revealed by the evidence or not, whether there's justification for committing on the charges laid or not. What are the ramifications of this decision? There are many and they're varied. It will mean, for instance, that Crown Council, if they are wise, will pay a lot more attention to informations before they commence their preliminary inquiry. Standard practice in virtually every jurisdiction, of course, is that information are originally drafted by police officers. You will pay now far greater attention to what does constitute an included offense. And if you're wary or concerned at all about whether or not what you think might be your alternative is an included offense, you'll ensure there's a second count in that information. Indeed, I would suspect that defense counsel may expect to see, in some jurisdictions, more charges laid initially on an information, forming the basis for a preliminary inquiry. And I suspect that in some cases they may well, e may well even shout that the shotgun approach is being used. We never used to, quite frankly, when I was prosecuting, pay a great deal of attention to the information, as I indicated before. Any problems? Well, you know, let's just get ahead with this thing. Let's not waste time now. We'll clear it up in the indictment. You can't do that anymore. You've got to make sure that what you want to go to the court with, the trial court, is on the information to begin with or you won't get your committal. Bear in mind, of course, the Chabot case in, in no way affects the power of the Crown to prefer an indictment. I should say the well, you use the Crown, it must be, of course, with the direction of the Attorney General on consent of the court, Section 469, 504, and related matters. This power exists whether or not there's been a committal. That's Chabot. I'm going to deal very briefly then with some other matters which have arisen in the last couple of years. First of all, the evidentiary basis for a committal. No great change, but there has been some, I suppose, clarification, purification of the principle that was, I think, best enunciated in the case of United States and Shepard in 1977. I think all of you are, will be very familiar with that case. Um, 
the uh, test basically is whether or not there is any evidence upon which a reasonable jury, properly instructed, could return a verdict of guilty. Properly instructed jury acting reasonably. I don't think anyone quarrels with the aptness, appropriateness of that test. In the Shepard case, as a result, if you, if you look at the decision very carefully, it would still leave the way open, apparently, to a discharge if, for instance, on circumstantial evidence, the circumstantial evidence was such to justify a withdrawal of a case from the jury if it was a trial court. I also, again, caution, uh, don't read head notes, read the cases, and don't just read the majority decision. Remember that in the Shepard case, the, there was a dissenting judgment expressed by Mr. Justice Spence, which was concurred in by Messrs. Justice Spates, Dixon, and the Chief Justice, a not inconsequential dissent. In other words, given a slightly different constituted court, God forbid, in, in, in uh, years to come, uh, you may well get something of a different interpretation. Law, of course, won't change, as I emphasized before. It'll just be reinterpreted. The dissent, and it's a well-written dissent, would by implication still allow a discharge if the evidence was so, and I'll use their terminology, so manifestly unreliable or of so dubious a nature that it would be unsafe to convict. Such a determination clearly presupposes or proposes a weighing of the evidence, which is not what you're supposed to do when you're presiding at a preliminary inquiry according to the majority decision. By the way, I emphasize that uh, you know, the, the, the tighter these restrictions, the easier they make my task at a preliminary inquiry. Uh, they, if, if there's anything that I do which is boring, it sometimes occurs during the course of a preliminary inquiry, where at a certain point, there's very little I've got to do apart from make certain that nobody gets too out of line. Uh, there's very little power that would seem to be left by recent decisions except that I do emphasize that they do not mean that a presiding judge, uh, presiding magistrate is simply a rubber stamp. Uh, case of uh, Rich Amakese and the Queen, case in the Saskatchewan Court of, of Queen's Bench, is an unfortunate case, and I, again, I won't go into detail, but uh, I, I, you, I cited it in my, in my material so that you'd read it with great care they did not rely on the, quote, reasonable jury properly instructed test. They referred back to the old test of probable guilt as opposed to possible guilt. They quashed a committal. Mr. Justice Mahar, I'm sorry, Mr. Justice Mahar quashed his committal of the presiding magistrate because the presiding magistrate had referred to the evidence as, quote, very slight, only enough to wonder about, and slim that the evidence was potentially suspicious. There seemed to be some general agreement that, that there was some evidence that Mr. Justice Mahar quashed the committal. I think that if you look at the decision, however, read it carefully, even though he didn't apply the Shepard test, that if you apply the properly instructed jury acting reasonably, and I underline the reasonably, that they, the test might still have re resulted in an acquittal. Two other cases of some significance, notwithstanding that they were uh, dealt with by my brethren on the provincial court bench and serve as uh, nothing other than persuasive precedent, the case of Regina and Solvay and Regina and Vandenbuse, decided by respectively um, provincial court judge Scullion and uh, his honor provincial court judge uh, Claire Lewis, make it clear uh, clarify again the test. His honor judge Scullion's decision in the Solvay case is, in my view, an excellent analysis of all of the case law and an application of that case law, the test for committal to a rather complex conspiracy matter, preliminary inquiry in a first degree murder charge, a uh, bunch of civically conscious Satan's choice and golden hawks became involved in a uh, philosophical altercation in the Queen's Hotel in Port Hope and uh, one of them stopped three bullets, uh, and it was a very complicated matter, and His Honor went into great detail in that case. The Van den Busche case, 
His Honor Judge Cheryl Lewis refused to commit and again went into considerable detail. Uh, there is a part, portion of his decision that must be read with great care because it w issued, his decision issued approximately a week before the Chabot case in the Ontario Court of Appeal, and he did consider his power to commit on other related offenses, concluding that he had that power, though it was, in his view, a discretionary power. I do emphasize this. It, it is my view, and I think supported by precedent, that whether or not to commit really is not or should not be a matter of discretion. If the test is met, the committal must follow. The remedy, however, the extraordinary remedy, is a discretionary remedy, and it is um, a Supreme Court judge or uh, a judge of the, a justice of the, of the Ontario Court of Appeal is entitled to exercise discretion in deciding whether or not the committal for trial was appropriate or not. Uh, Martin Simar Desjardins, the Queen, the dredging conspiracy case, uh, deals with the test for assessing whether or not the committal was appropriate. They don't necessarily go back to properly instruct the jury acting reasonably. Test in that case, uh, Chief Justice Laskin affirmed was a review to determine whether the committal was made arbitrarily or at most whether there was some evidence upon which an opinion could be formed that the accused should go to trial. That case has been analyzed by a number of different cases, including Robar and the Queen, an excellent case. And I'm moving on, you'll pardon me very quickly, because they're all in the, uh, in the paper, and I don't want to take any more of your time than you've, is absolutely necessary. There, what I'm trying to do is find something which may give you problems. Ah, Demaray and the Queen, sort of an interesting situation. This was an application for habeas corpus with certiorari and aid regarding a committal on a charge of first-degree murder. Decision of uh, Chief Justice Hallam speaking for the Ontario Court of Appeal. This was a fire in a rooming house. Ba evidence basically was there had been an altercation between the accused and some tenants. I uh, won't go into the reasons for the altercation. In the lower floor, fire was set. He was subsequently found fire damaged mildly, and uh, some tenants in an upper floor died of uh, smoke inhalation, as I recollect. Circumstantial evidence, basically. His, uh, his lordship, however, in quashing the committal, ruled that there was not sufficient evidence to put the accused on a charge of first-degree murder. That it could not, however, be said that there was no evidence which could form the basis for a judicial opinion there was sufficient evidence to put the accused in charge on trial for a charge of second-degree murder. What he did with that, however, is the interesting thing. Ms. Justice Kreber, Kreber in, in, the, in the Jolly case, which I've already referred to, in dealing with a committal for trial, quashed the committal on a charge of first-degree murder, felt that the, I'm always very careful and cautious about interpreting decisions when those responsible for their decisions are, are sitting beside me, felt that the application of the properly instructed jury acting reasonably test would not justify a committal on first degree murder, but there would have been in that case as well justification for committal on a charge of second degree murder. However, he felt that in that case that his power was limited to either confirming the committal or quashing the committal and discharging the accused. In the Demary case, the Chief Justice felt that uh, Mr. Justice Creever was in error in coming to that determination redisposition. And he said that it was appropriate that a judge in, uh, justice in those circumstances use Section 709 of the Code to order the detention of the accused and, quote, direct the judge under whose warrant he is in custody or any other judge to take any proceedings, hear such evidence, or do any other thing that in the opinion of the court will best further the ends of justice. He continued, we do not think that we should order an entirely new preliminary inquiry, but that the Crown should be given the right to call further evidence as to the charge of first degree murder. The appellants should have the right to cross-examine all witnesses so called and to call further evidence. The preliminary inquiry should be completed as expeditiously as possible. Now that intrigues me. They didn't simply remit the matter for an appropriate committal if the provincial court judge was so advised on the second degree murder charge. Effectively, what they did was they reopened the preliminary inquiry. 
Now, I, I can see that there are circumstances one might clearly envisage when you see on the record that the clause is, shall we, the Crown has, has closed this case prematurely, either as a result of some clear agreement that exists between Crown and Defense Counsel, or perhaps as a result of what are found to be inappropriate comments indicating he's heard enough from a, a presiding magistrate. But in most cases, it's my respectful view that the preliminary inquiry is over. If there has been committal on a wrong charge, but there is a basis for committal possibly on a lesser included offense, it should simply be remitted at that stage, the end of the preliminary inquiry, for the presiding judge's uh, conclusion. Remor Ovensky and the Queen is a case which I think will give you some considerable difficulty. A 1981 case, very recent case in the Alberta Court of Appeal. Messrs. Justice Morrill and Stevenson and uh, Chief Justice McGilvery all came to the same conclusion, though for different, somewhat different reasons, that the committal of the presiding magistrate was proper. This was a trial, uh, sorry, a preliminary inquiry under the Customs Act. The application for certiorari to quash the committal was based on the fact that uh, defense argued, the applicant argued, that there was no evidence of an essential ingredient of the charge, the charge itself being possession of goods unlawfully imported, to, to, to cite it shortly to you, into Canada, the subject of the allegation being some jewelry that was labeled made in Israel, uh, that label apparently being the only evidence, as I read the case, of, of any uh, origin outside the country at all. There was clearly no evidence deduced by the Crown at the preliminary that the goods had been unlawfully imported at all. And the Alberta Court of Appeal found that the presiding magistrate had erred in law in interpreting the Customs Act to place a reverse onus on the defense. In other words, the presiding magistrate had said, sure, there's no evidence of unlawfully imported, but the onus to disprove unlawful import importing is on the defense. I'm, I'm summarizing considerably. Alberta Court of Appeal said, no, no, that's not so. There has to be some evidence. It's an essential vermin. It's, in, it's incumbent upon the ground to deduce evidence of that fact. But they said, that notwithstanding that there was no evidence with respect to that averment, the committal must stand as the, as the presiding magistrate had not erred in exercising his jurisdiction. He had not exceeded his jurisdiction. Mr. Justice Morrow put the court's concern this way, it now becomes necessary to consider whether in a situation where, as in the present case, the lack of evidence so found comes about through application of a construction of law, in other words, as the result of the presiding magistrate's application of the onus section, can be considered as falling into the category of no evidence in the sense used above, or whether it represents an adjudication which fills the gap, and even if that adjudication may not have been right, would still place the exercise of jurisdiction outside a review by, by certiorari. He answers that question as follows. What the learned provincial judge did here was, in my opinion, an adjudication in the course of exercising his proper jurisdiction. His statement as to there being absolutely no evidence as to the third essential to be proven was still part of his adjudication. As an adjudication in these circumstances, and as I read the authorities discussed above, this can at most only be an error in the exercise of his jurisdiction and cannot be considered as falling within the type of situation classified as lack of jurisdiction. Now, Doggone it, with all due respect to the court, I mean, that, that is just simply illogical. And in my view, it has been so found by the Ontario Court of Appeal. However you want to express it, talking about exceeding jurisdiction or lack of jurisdiction, you're still left with no essential, no evidence with respect to an essential averment. Would that same court, for instance, have interfered with a committal had a presiding magistrate incorrectly ruled that such and such a, 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 an allegation in account was not an essential averment and no evidence need be called. In other words, erred in law in interpreting the requirements in that regard. Or if, in fact, the only evidence that, that was admitted before the court with respect to an essential averment was inadmissible evidence, and on that basis committal occurred. As I read their decision, and I, and I hate this to sound, un, I have no right to sound unkind, but uh, it seems that if a judge adverts to an issue, then he may, as long as he's wrong according, as long as he adverts to it, he may be wrong according to the Alberta Court of Appeal, but he still exercises his jurisdiction and they won't interfere with that. In this province, however, the situation in my view is quite different as revealed by two cases, and I think they're the last I'm going to direct for your attention. Cases of Ree Katz and the Queen and Ree Stilo and the Queen. 
in the Katz case, which more or less went along with the philosophy of the Moravinsky case, Mr. Justice Eberly refused to quash a committal. Interesting case. A real conundrum. You could just see it. I mean, everybody wanted to do what probably might have been viewed by many as the right thing in this case, but it just didn't make any sense. Hughes was charged with indecent assault on an eight-and-a-half-year-old girl who was not sworn. The only evidence of the commission of the offense was, therefore, the unsworn and uncorroborated evidence of that eight-year-old. 586 of the Criminal Code, uh, 16 of the Evidence Act, requires, of course, corroboration for there to be a conviction in that situation. Very interesting interpretation, however. His Lordship said, it is clear from the provincial court judge's reasons for judgment that in his opinion the evidence was sufficient to put the accused on trial. Undoubtedly he had in mind, this is very interesting, that at a trial the trial judge might decide the girl should be sworn. If the trial judge did so and if her evidence were believed, a conviction could result. There was proper material to be found in the evidence of the young girl which might at the trial be admitted as sworn evidence. There was therefore a proper basis and he goes on. Now, <coughs> at least his lordship is basing the justification for the committal not on no evidence, re and essential averments, such as in the Moravinsky case, but at least on potential evidence. He said, well, it, it wasn't evidence there before a presiding magistrate, but he obviously had in mind that uh, given the backlog, this matter might not get to trial for two years, and she'll be 10 and that much older and brighter in two years of Sunday school, and she can be sworn. I'm being a little bit facetious, but in other words, it, would, it is clearly up to the trial judge to decide independently whether or not he's going to swear the girl. And, and given that option, they, there was found to be a basis for appeal. Won't go on with the rest of the reasons, but that case stopped there. We then get to the Stilo case, however. Stilo case virtually exactly the same facts. And we deal with the decision of Mr. Justice Corey in the Supreme Court of Ontario, who agrees with Mr. Justice Everly and says basically that he's, notwithstanding the lack of corroborated uns, uh, corroboration for the unsworn testimony, there is a basis there which should go to trial. Goes to the Ontario Court of Appeal, however. Mr. Justice Morden, speaking for Ms. Justice Arnup and the Chief Justice, that is quite a triumvirate, reviews the test of committal, reviews the Martin Simard case and decides, no, no, it's just not logical. I mean, however you want to express it, talk about potential evidence or what the trial judge could do at the preliminary inquiry, there just is no evidence upon which to base committal. He says, quote, in our view, there was no evidence in this case satisfying these requirements. There was in law no evidence, in law, no evidence upon, at all upon which a finding of guilt could be made. If failure to meet a mandatory corroboration requirement has to result in the case being taken from a jury, which it does, then it could not be argued that a different result should occur with respect to preliminary inquiry, unless it could be said that the error fell short of being of a jurisdictional nature. In our view, it is established that the complete absence of evidence does amount to jurisdictional error. And they go on. I've got some fascinating stuff here, which I'm not going to give to you now. It's, it's all here, and I know that uh, you're going to leave. Can I just take two minutes of your time, however, and make some totally gratuitous comments that have absolutely no academic value to them at all, but I think should be of practical concern. Read the case of Falovich. Quebec Course of Sessions, Mr. Uh, Mr. Justice Boilard. It's in French. You will be able to interpret it yourself or find someone who will interpret it for you without any degree of difficulty. The there are other areas of concern in the case, but I think one of the most important things to take from that particular case is that it confirms the preliminary inquiry is not only alive and well, but has a purpose other than simply a determination whether there's sufficient evidence to warrant committal for trial. That may be the primary function of the uh, primary purpose, but it's not the only function. And I emphasize to you that if you act responsibly, that you will have every right and privilege accorded to you, in my view, and should have every right and privilege accorded to you in a preliminary inquiry. There's no question that lengthy preliminary inquiries have been a considerable cause of concern to the administration of justice because we just can't afford it anymore. But I emphasize it's a critically important right if you use it responsibly. Don't use a preliminary inquiry if disclosure will suffice. 
Bear in mind, we won't get into that, but there are, of course, new guidelines requiring all Crown attorneys in this province, which the Federal Department of Justice have adopted voluntarily, uh, to disclose their case. For mere disclosure, discovery is better because you can sit down and chat across a table and, and cross-reference and go back and forth. But sometimes, but sometimes, preliminary inquiry and the testing or the pinning down of evidence is of critical importance to either the defense or the Crown. And for what it's worth, I, often, I was always very, very cautious when I was uh, involved in a case of any significance, uh, at the preliminary inquiry stage, when defense counsel came to me and said, hey, no problem, Bob, we're going to waive the prelim in this case, uh, agree to committal. I'd say, gee, I wonder why he's doing that, and I'd have a pretty hard look at it. Many cases where a defense is prepared to waive, a case involving rape, for instance, I very much myself wanted to see how the complainant would give her evidence under oath. Besides that, it, it provided a, a, a good basis to give her some practice. Don't be too willing to waive. Be candid, however, with the court. If there's no issue as to committal, but both counsel are agreed that there is certain evidence that they want to explore, indicate that to the court. And again, you will, I think, be more successful in ensuring the cooperation of the court. Last practical consideration is this. If the evidence, if the evidence is weak, what do you do? You can try to turn it into a trial. If you don't want to do that, you may well decide to back off a little bit. Don't use all your ammunition with specific witnesses at a preliminary inquiry. And I emphasize this to you. There has been many a prosecution that's been won between the preliminary inquiry and the trial because by virtue of diligent effort on the part of defense counsel, Crown counsel had pointed out to him very clearly where all the areas of weakness lay. Know your case well beforehand. And if you happen to run into a provincial court judge who has a less than fervent belief in uh, the fact that he has the right to discharge an accused at a preliminary inquiry, particularly in those situations, you might decide to back off. Read the paper, it's all in there. <laughs>